little chute, little chute we're by the, the cedar point, the cedars, the treaty of the cedars, which is, uh, I detail in a chapter called the uh, Great Cedar Point Swindle. Uh, the signing of the treaty with the Menominee, which effectively removed them from the Fox Valley, allowed all the Yankees to, Americans to come in and take all this wonderful land and this river, this wonderful river, which is the greatest hydroelectric producing river in the United States at that time. It was a gold mine. The treaty that allowed them to come in was nothing short of a swindle, and it was nasty, and it made fortunes here in uh, the valley. I'd like to, uh, uh, it involved uh, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 paved the way for the basic the removal of the Menominee. Basically, uh, they had no choice. It was uh, leave, leave your land, we'll sort of pay you for it, or else. Military removal. They had no choice. They had nothing to bargain with. Here's a little bit about who raked in the money and how they raked it in. The negotiations between Governor Dodge and the Menominee, oh, by the way, that's, that's Governor Dodge right there, and his, uh, his, he was quite a dresser. And he always carried guns, he carried maybe six or seven guns at a time. Wanted to look powerful. The negotiations lasted six days. From Chief Oshkosh's point of view, it was six days of extortion. The Menominee lost the Fox River Valley, large sections of land to the west, and all of their land in Upper Michigan. They were permanently removed from the fur trade and forced to pay all debts to traders and businessmen. Middlemen made out like bandits, and many quick fortunes were made. In order to collect money from the treaty, all that a local white or half-breed VIP had to do was show up. Besides the traders who cleared $700,000 in Menominee money, there were Charles Grignon and his family. His fee for services rendered as an interpreter was ten thousand dollars in eighteen thirties? That is, that is, that is uh, five million dollars today. That is shocking. That is just shocking. He also collected additional money as a trader. Several other Greenians joined in to pay as well, and all the money was deducted from the sum paid to the Menominee for their land. So they were paid. But as the British officers warned the Menominee, he said, "Do not trust Americans." because they'll do this to you. And what happened? They paid them the money, then they said, well, here's our expenses. So, you know, most of it came right back. Um, uh, at the time, it was impossible to see, but in the long run, Chief Oshkosh won. The Menominee are the only tribe east of the Mississippi River to retain any semblance of their original lands. And they survived intact on that line. In the meantime, Oshkosh had to live with a series of extraordinary losses. He suffered through having his memory preserved by a staged photograph showing him wear a, wearing a hat that he detested. He became a subject of white ridicule, and perhaps worst of all, his name and likeness were soon to be used on a beer can. During his life, he never received recognition for saving his tribe and a small portion of its land. His final actions as chief were of lasting importance. He taught his people how to manage and conserve their timber resources. 46 varieties of trees and a healthy 1.7 billion board feet of lumber became the backbone of the tribal economy for later generations. And here's a fun fact, I bet you don't know this. From space, this is a, a NASA loves the Menominee Reservation. From space, an astronaut can tell exactly where the Menominee Reservation is. It is a patch of green in a modeled background. NASA and Air Force used the northwest corner of this reservation, which is a perfect square, to calibrate their spaceport equipment. Oshkosh's legacy is painted on the surface of this planet. The space, the, uh, space station uses that corner to calibrate their equipment. Yes? They used to work for the tribes of Wisconsin. One of the things I came to know while working there is one of the older chiefs, it may have been Oshkosh or another one about that time, basically he told the tribe, he says, we will start on one side of our reservation and harvest only the largest of trees. When we get to the other side, we will then return again. They have one of the best stands of timber in, 
in the Midwest oh, because of that. It's the finest standard. Term. It was the beginning of what's called select harvesting. Well, that's real interesting. Yeah. Thank Wise you. Wise guy. My but I can't remember the specific chief that was involved, with, but it was about that period of time. That's very interesting because my father is a lumberman. Yeah. And uh, I didn't grow up here, I grew up in the Philippines. It's a relatively simple concept. We start on yeah. one side of the reservation, we work our way to the other, and then we'll do it again. Well, they used select harvesting. Select harvesting, yeah. yes. That's we'll exactly take we only the biggest of trees. Yeah. Back in the 1800s, we did not use select harvesting, we used slash and burn which is slash all the trees and burn the ones you don't use. And I've, uh, has, have any of you seen, I don't want to repeat myself too much. Uh, if you lived in, App let's say Appleton, let's say the, the, the heights of Appleton on the north side, and you looked west in the years 1875 to 1889, you could trace, you could trace the exact position of where the timber crews were by the fires that burned incessantly every night. There was smoke in the distance, and you could follow it. Well, they've cut this far up the Wolf River. They've cut that far, they've cut that far, they've cut that far. And it progressed until they completely eradicated all the stands of trees, all the way up to the Wolf River until you couldn't see anymore from the valley. OK, what you picked was the story of Lizzie McCourt. Baby Doe Tabor, the richest, almost the richest woman in America in the 1800s. She was from Oshkosh, of course. This is her demise. Good one. In 1935, Lizzie McCourt, a.k.a. Baby Doe Tabor, a.k.a. one of the richest women who ever lived, was found dead. A major blizzard had moved into the mountains. This is in Colorado, by the way. Lizzie was cut off for two weeks. A lady from town who made a point of checking in on her noticed there was no smoke coming from the stack of Lizzie's shack. A nearby miner, Tom French, was summoned. He pushed his way through six-foot snowbanks that were piled up against the pathetic structure. He kicked through the window pane and crawled in head first. Lizzie was on the floor. An autopsy would find bloody welts all across her upper body, arms, and head, where she violently scratched and tore at her skin. Clumps of her once beautiful hair, I and mean, it was beautiful, lay strewn across the floor, still attached to bits, bits of scalp tissue. Beside her frozen, painted, con pain-contorted body was the book that had both guided her and fueled wild visions during her 35-year stretch in purgatory, The Lives of the Fathers, Martyrs, and Other Principal Saints by Alvin Butler. Well, that, that's a lot of questions in that sentence, but it was that one. I actually, we, when we were in Colorado a couple of years ago, we actually um, toured where her shack was. Really? Yeah. You were there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you start reading her story, I'm like, I don't want that story. <laughs> this is from a photograph. Lizzie was famous for her hair. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful hair. And she, uh, she, she lived a long time in Oshkosh, and in Oshkosh she watched it burn down and rise up and burn down. I mean, what's a lumber town like Oshkosh? Oshkosh is the only town in the world that would locate a match factory <laughs> in, in, in the middle of lumber mills. <laughs> I've been kind of mean to Oshkosh during my stops, but I do love Oshkosh. And I've done a lot of reading about Oshkosh's nightlife, which in the 1880s was insane. A lot of people do not know that the, the lumberjacks come in, everybody came in. It was the red light of red light districts, and it catered to men and women. People don't know that. It was extraordinary. And, and the interesting thing to me was, I read an 1871 headline in the Oshkosh Northwestern that said, man stabbed in neck by knife. <laughs> Two days later, I picked up the Oshkosh North, North, right now, Oshkosh Northwestern, man stabbed in neck by a knife. <laughs> that was two summers ago. <laughs> so maybe things haven't changed. <laughs> um, Joe McCarthy's funeral passed through Little Shoot. Does, did anybody see it? Anybody live here that? Anybody? Uh, uh, I'll just read a little tiny bit here, because it's kind of interesting. 
Joe McCarthy's body was loaded into a hearse at Austin Straubel Field in Green Bay. Joe, his widow, various family members, senators, congressmen, government officials, and members of the press were part of a slow-moving 54-car procession about to leave for Appleton. The McCarthy funeral entourage made the trip to Wisconsin in two U.S. Air Force planes. Joe, Joe's widow, Jean, traveled with family and friends in one jet, while Joe's casket traveled in the other with politicians and reporters. The party was definitely on Joe's plane. <laughs> Drinks flowed while congressmen swapped McCarthy stories and played poker atop his flag-covered casket. A Marine honor guard met the planes and snapped to attention when Joe's coffin was brought out. Drunken reporters and congressmen literally stumbled down the stairs behind the casket. It's a miracle no one was hurt. A fair-sized crowd gathered around the plane. A troop of Cub Scouts from Dupier was greeted by Mrs. McCarthy. Some of Joe's old friends were there. One stood alone and cried before returning to his car. The entourage headed south on Highway 41, then turned east to Kakana alongside the Fox River. People gathered in clumps along the route. Following the river towards Appleton, the caravan made a brief stop in Little Shoot. A crowd of more than 500 people gathered to watch Reverend Martin Voss, tell me if I pronounce this correctly, Voss speak of the St. John's Catholic Church, Bless the Casket. Five minutes later, they were on their way. They passed the site on the Fox River where Territorial Governor Henry Dodge and the reluctant Chief Oshkosh signed the Treaty of the Cedars. In Appleton, the motorcade was greeted by a motorcycle police and guided to College Avenue. On the avenue, the Viking Theater was showing the girl in the Kremlin. Is Stalin alive? Asked one of the posters facing out the street. The funeral cortege didn't answer. It drove slowly by, turned south on State Street, and arrived at St. Mary's Church. That's a little bit of little shoot in Joe McCarthy's funeral procession.